for Bard she sat in, like a burnished throne, burned on the water. The poop was beaten gold, purple the sails, and so perfumed that the winds were lovesick with them. The oars were silver, which to the tune of flutes kept stroke, and made the water which they beat to follow faster, as amorous of their strokes. For her own person, it beggared all description. She did lie in her pavilion cloth of gold of tissue, or picturing that Venus where we see the fancy outwork nature. On each side her stood pretty dimpled boys like smiling cupids with divers colored fans, whose wind did seem to glow the delicate cheeks which they did cool, and what they undid, did. Her gentlewomen, like the Nereids, so many mermaids tended her in the eyes and made their bends at dawnings. At the helm, a seeming mermaid steers. The silken tackle swell with the touches of those flower-soft hands that yearly framed the office. From the barge, a strange invisible perfume hits the sense of the adjacent wharfs. The city cast her people out upon her, and Antony, enthroned in the marketplace, did sit alone, whistling to the air, which, but for vacancy, had gone to gaze on Cleopatra too, and made a gap in nature. Age cannot wither her, nor custom stale her infinite variety. Other women cloy the appetites they feed, but she makes hungry where most she satisfies. The great Roman Empire is ruled by three men, Octavius Caesar, Lepidus, and Mark Antony. Wars are brewing. Antony dallies in Egypt under the spell of Cleopatra. If it be love indeed, tell me how much. There's beggary in the love that can be reckoned. I'll set a born how far to be beloved. <laughs> the now must needs find out a new heaven, a new earth. News, my good lord, from Rome. Nay, here are the ambassadors. Oh, dear, thy wife is dead. Where died she? In Sicium. Her length of sickness with what else more serious in Porto Theta now despairs. Leave me. There's a great spirit gone. I must from this enchanting queen break off 10,000 harms more than the ills I know my idleness doth hatch. How now, in above us? Sir? What's your pleasure, sir? I must with haste from hence. Fulvia is dead. Sir? Fulvia is dead. Why, sir, give the gods a thankful sacrifice. If there were no more women but Fulvia, then had you indeed a cut in the case to be lamented. The business she hath broached in the state cannot endure my absence. And the business you've broached here cannot be without you, especially that of Cleopatra's, which wholly depends on your approval. No more light answers. Let our officers have notice what we purpose. I shall break the cause of our expedience to the Queen and get her leave to part. Now, my dearest Queen. Pray you stand farther from me. What's the matter? I know by that same eye there's no good news. What says the married woman? You may go. Would she had never given you leave to come? Let her not say it is I that keeps you here. I have no power upon you. Hers you are. The God's best now. Oh, never was their queen so mightily betrayed. Yet at the first I saw the treasons planted. Cleopatra. Why should I think you can be mine and true, though you in swearing shake the throned gods who have been false to Fulvia? Right as madness to be entangled with these mouth-made vows which break themselves in swearing. Most sweet queen. Nay, pray you seek no colour for your going, but bid farewell and go. When you sued staying, then was the time for words. No going then. Eternity was in our lips and eyes, bliss in our brows bent. None our part so poor, but was a race of heaven. They are so still, or thou the greatest soldier of the world art turned the greatest liar. How now, lady? I would I had thy inches. Thou shouldst know they were a heart in Egypt. Hear me, queen. The strong necessity of time commands our services a while, but my full heart remains in use with you. Our Italy shines o'er with civil swords. Sextus Pompeius makes his approaches to the port of Rome. Equality of two domestic powers breeds scrupulous faction. My more particular, and that which most with you should safe my going, is Fulvia's death. 
Though age from folly could not give me freedom, it does from childishness. Can Fulvia die? She's dead, my queen. Look here, and at thy sovereign leisure read the garboils she awaked. At the last, best, see when and where she died. Oh, most false love. Now I see, I see in Fulvia's death how mine received shall be. I'll leave you, lady. Courteous lord, one word. Sir, you and I must part, but that's not it. Sir, you and I have loved, but there's not it. That you know well. Something it is I would. Oh, my oblivion. All forgotten. But that your royalty holds idleness your subject, I should take you for idleness itself. Tis sweating labor to bear such idleness so near the heart as Cleopatra this. But, sir, forgive me. Since my becomings kill me when they do not eye well to you, your honor calls you hence. Therefore be deaf and all the gods go with you. Moral victory and smooth success be strewed before your feet. Let us go. Our separation so abides and flies that thou residing here goest yet with me, and I hence fleeting here remain with thee. Away. In Rome, Octavius Caesar capes at Antony's absence. You may see Lepidus and henceforth know it is not Caesar's natural vice to hate our great competitor. From Alexandria, this is the news. He fishes, drinks, and wastes the lamps of night in revel. Hardly gave audience or vouchsafe to think he had partners. I must not think there are evils now to darken all his goodness. His faults in him seem as the spots of heaven, more fiery by night's blackness. Hereditary rather than purchased. What he cannot change than what he chooses. You are too indulgent. Let us grant it is not amiss to tumble on the bed of Ptolemy, to give a kingdom for a mirth. Say this becomes him. Yet must Antony no way excuse his soils when we do bear so great weight in his likeness. Here's more news. Thy biddings have been done, and every hour, most noble Caesar, shalt thou have report how tis abroad. Pompey is strong at sea, and, it appears, he is beloved of those that only have feared Caesar. To the ports the discontents repair, and men's reports give him much wrong. I should have known no less. No vessel can peep forth, but tis as soon taken as seen. For Pompey's name strikes more than could his war resisted. Antony, leave thy lascivious wassails. Let his shames quickly drive him to Rome. Tis time we twain did show ourselves at the field. And to that end, assemble we immediate council. Pompey thrives in our idleness. Charnian. Madam? Ah. Give me to drink, man dragon. Why, madam? That I might sleep out this great gap of time my Antony is away. You think of him too much. Oh, Charmian. Where thinkst thou he is now? Stands he, or sits he? Or does he walk? Or is he on his horse? Oh, happy horse to bear the weight of Antony. Do bravely, horse, for what's thou whom thou movest? The demi-atlas of this earth, the arm and burgeonet of men. He's speaking now, or murmuring, where's my serpent of old Nile? For so he calls me. Now I feed myself with most delicious poison. Think on me that am with Phoebus amorous pinches black and wrinkled deep in time. Broad-fronted Caesar, when thou wast here above the ground, I was a morsel for a monarch. And great Pompey would stand and make his eyes grow in my brow. There would he anchor his aspect and die with looking on his light. Sovereign of Egypt, hail. Alexis. How much unlike art thou, Mark Antony, yet coming from him that great medicine hath with his tinct gilded thee. How goes it with my brave Mark Antony? Last thing he did, dear queen, he kissed the last of many doubled kisses, this orient pearl. His speech sticks in my heart. Mine ear must pluck it thence. Good friend, quoth he, say the firm Roman to great Egypt sends this treasure of an oyster. At whose foot, to mend the petty present, I will peace her opulent throne with kingdoms, 
All the East, say thou, shall call her mistress. What was he sad or merry? Like to the time of the year, between the extremes of hot and cold, he was nor sad nor merry. Oh, well divided disposition. Note him, note him, good Charmian, tis the man, but note him. He was not sad, for he would shine on those that make their looks by his. He was not merry, which seemed to tell them his remembrance lay in Egypt with his joy. But between both, oh, heavenly mingle, be'st thou sad or merry, the violence of either thee becomes, so does it no man else. Did I, Charmian, ever love Caesar so? Oh, that brave Caesar. Be choked with such another emphasis, say the brave Antony. The valiant Caesar. By Isis, I will give thee bloody teeth if thou wilt Caesar paragon again, my man of men. By your most gracious pardon, I sing but after you. Ha, oh, my salad days, when I was green in judgment, cold in blood to say as I said then. Octavius Caesar and Antony meet in the Roman Senate. Welcome to Rome. Thank you. I learn you take things ill which are not so, or being concern you not. I must be laughed at, if for, for nothing or a little I should say myself offended, and with you chiefly of the world. My being in Egypt, Caesar, what was it to you? No more than my residing here at Rome might be to you in Egypt. Yet, if you there did practice on my estate, your being in Egypt might be my question. How intend you practice? You may be pleased to catch at mine intent by what it here befall me. Your wife and brother made wars upon me, and their contestation was theme for you. You were the word of war. You do mistake your business. My brother never did urge me in his act. Did he not rather discredit my authority with yours? Of this my letters before did satisfy you. If you will patch a quarrel, it must not be with this. As for my wife, I would you had her spirit in such another. The third of the world is yours, which with a snaffle you may pace easy, but not such a wife. So much... Uncurbable her garboil, Caesar, made out of her impatience. I, grieving grant, did you too much disquiet, for that you must but say I could not help it. You have broken the article of your oath, which you shall never have tongue to charge me with. Soft, Caesar. No, Leverus, let him speak. The honor is sacred which he talks on now, supposing that I lacked it. But on, Caesar, the article of my oath. To lend me arms and aid when I required them, the which you both denied. Neglected, rather. And then, when poisoned hours had bound me up for mine own knowledge, truth is that Fulvia, to have me out of Egypt, made wars here, for which myself, the ignorant motive, do so far ask pardon, as befits mine honor, to stoop in such a case. Tis noble spoken. I do not much dislike the matter, but the manner of his speech. Yet, if I knew what hoop would hold a staunch, from edge to edge of the world I would pursue it. Give me leave, Caesar. Speak, Agrippa. Thou hast a sister by the mother's side, admired Octavia. Great Mark Antony is now a widower. Say not so, Agrippa. If Cleopatra heard you, your reproof were well deserved of rashness. I am not married, Caesar. Let me hear Agrippa further speak. To hold you in perpetual amity, to make you brothers, and to knit your hearts with an unslipping knot, take Antony, Octavia to his wife whose beauty claims no worse a husband than the best of men, whose virtue and whose general graces speak that which none else can utter. By this marriage, all little jealousies which now seem great, and all great fears which now import their dangers, would then be nothing. Truths would be but tales, where now half tales be truths. Her love to both would each to other, and all loves to both draw after her. Now pardon what I have spoke. For tis a studied, not a present thought, by duty ruminated. Will Caesar speak? Not till he hears how Antony is touched with what is spoke already. What power is in Agrippa, if I would say Agrippa be it so, to make this good? A power of Caesar, and his power unto Octavia. May I never, to this good purpose that so fairly shows, dream of impediment. Let me have thy hand. Further this act of grace. And from this hour, the heart of brothers govern in our loves and sway our great desires. There's my hand, a sister, I bequeath you, whom no brother did ever love so dearly. Let her live to join our kingdoms and our hearts and never fly off our loves again. Oh, happily, amen. <laughs> Oh. 
Give me some music. Music, moody fool of us that trade in love. The music, oh. Let it alone. Let's do billiards. Come, charming. My arm is sore. Best play with Mardian. As well a woman with an eunuch played as with a woman. Come, you play with me, sir? As well as I can, madam. And when goodwill is showed, don't come too short. The actor may plead pardon. While oh, none now. Give me mine angle. We'll to the river. There, my music playing far off. I will betray tawny finned fishes. My bended hook shall pierce their slimy jaws. And as I draw them up, I'll think them every one an Antony and say, Aha, you're caught. Twas merry when you wagered on your angling, when your diver did hang a salt fish on his hook, which he with fervency drew up. That time, oh, times I laughed him out of patience, and that night I laughed him into patience. And next morn, ere the ninth hour, I drunk him to his bed. Then put my tires and mantles on him, whilst I wore his sword, Philippan. Oh, from Italy, ram thou thy fruitful tidings in mine ears that long time have been barren. Madam, madam. Anton is dead. If thou say so, villain, thou killst thy mistress. But well and free, if thou so yield him, there is gold. And here my bluest veins to kiss, a hand that kings have lipped and trembled kissing. Good madam, hear me. I have a mind to strike the air thou speakst. Yet if thou say Antony lives, is well, or friends with Caesar, or not captive to him, I'll set thee in a shower of gold, and hail rich pearls upon thee. Madam, he's well. Well said. Caesar and he are greater friends than ever. Make thee a fortune from me. But yet, madam. I do not like but yet. He does allay the good precedence. Fie upon but yet. But yet is as a jailer to bring forth some monstrous malefactor. Prithee, friend, pour out the pack of matter to mine ear, the good and bad together. He's friends with Caesar, in state of health thou sayest, and thou sayest free. Free, madam? No, I made no such report. He's bound unto Octavia. Bill, Johnny. Madam, he's married to Octavia. The most infectious pestilence upon thee. Good madam, patience. What say you? Hence, horrible villain, or I'll spurn thine eyes like balls before me, and on hair thy head. Gracious madam, either do bring the news, made not the match. It is not so a province I will give thee, and make thy fortunes proud. He's married, madam. Rogue, thou hast lived too long. Nay, then I'll run. Good madam, keep yourself within yourself. The man is innocent. Some innocent scape not the thunderbolt. Melt Egypt into Nile, and kindly creatures turn all to serpents. Call the slave again. Though I am mad, I will not bite him. Call. He is afeard to come. I will not hurt him. These hands do lack nobility that they strike a meaner than myself, since I myself have given myself the call. Come hither, sir. Most gracious majesty. Didst thou behold Octavia? I drink, queen. Where? Madam in Rome. I looked her in the face, and saw her led between her brother and Mark Antony. Is she as tall as me? She is not, madam. Did she hear her speak? Is she shrill-tongued or low? Madam, I heard her speak. She is low-voiced. That's not so good. He cannot like her long. Like her? Oh, I, sister's impossible. I think so, Charmian, dull of tongue and dwarfish. What majesty is in her gait? Remember, if e'er thou look'st on majesty? She creeps. <laughs> her motion and her station are as one. He is very knowing, I do perceive. It. There's nothing in her yet. The fellow has good judgment. Excellent. Madam, she was a widow. A widow! Charmian, hark. And I do think she's thirty. There's thou her face in mind. It's long or round. Round, even to faultiness. For the most part, too, they are foolish that are so. Her hair, what colour? Brown, madam. And her forehead as low as she would wish it. There's gold for thee. Thou must not take my former sharpness ill. I will employ thee back again. I find thee most fit for business. Go, make thee ready. Our letters are prepared. Antony is unfaithful to Octavia and returns to Cleopatra. Octavia Caesar is enraged.
Hear me, Agrippa. Contemning Rome, he has done all this and more in Alexandria. Here's the manner of it. In the marketplace, on a tribunal silvered, Cleopatra and himself in chairs of gold were publicly enthroned. At the feet sat Caesarion, whom they call my father's son. Unto her he gave the establishment of Egypt, made her of lower Syria, Cyprus, Lydia, absolute queen. This in the public eye? In the common showplace where they exercise. His son he there proclaimed the king of kings. Let Rome be thus informed. The people know it and have now received his accusations. Who does he accuse? Caesar. And that having in Sicily Sextus Pompeius spoiled, we had not rated him his part of the isle. Then, does he say, he lent me some shipping unrestored. Lastly, he frets that Lepidus of the Triumvirate should be deposed, and being that, we detain all his revenue. Sir, this should be answered. Tis done already, and the messenger gone. I have told him Lepidus was grown too cruel, that he his high authority abused, and did deserve his change. For what I have conquered, I grant him part. But then, in his Armenia and other of his conquered kingdoms, I demand the like. You never yield to that. Nor must not then be yielded to in this. <laughs> Octavius Caesar sets sail for Egypt. In Obarbus, we will fight with him by sea. By sea? What else? Why will my lord do so? For that he dares us to it. Your ships are not well manned. Your mariners are muleters, reapers, people engrossed by swift impress. In Caesar's fleet are those that often have against Pompey fought. Their ships are yard, yours heavy. No disgrace shall fall you for refusing him at sea, being prepared for land. By sea, by sea. Most worthy sir, you therein throw away the absolute soldiership you have by land. Distract your army, which doth most consist of war-marked footmen. Leave unexecuted your own renowned knowledge, quite forego the way which promises assurance, and give up yourself merely to chance and hazard from firm security. I'll fight at sea. I have sixty sails. These are none better. Our overplus of shipping will be burned, and with the rest full man from the head of Actium beat the approaching Caesar. But if we fail, we can then do it at land. Thy business? The news is true, my lord. He is described. Caesar has taken Torrent. It is impossible, strange, that his power shall be. In Obabus, our nineteen legions thou shalt hold by land, and our twelve thousand horse. Wheel to our ship. Away, my feeders. the Egyptian admiral, with all their sixty fly and turn the rudder, to see it mine eyes are blasted. Gods and goddesses, all the whole synod of them. What's thy passion, Scarus? How appears the fight? On our side, like the token pestilence where death is sure. Yard ribaldry nag of Egypt, whom leprosy or take, in the midst of the fight, when vantage like a pair of twins appeared, hoist sails and flies. That I beheld. Mine eyes did sicken at the sight and could not endure a further view. She once be in Luf, the noble ruin of her magic Antony. Claps on his sea wing and flies after her. I never saw an action of such shame. Experience, manhood, honor, ne'er before did violate so itself. Alack, alack. Hark, the land bids me tread no more upon it. It is a shame to bear me. Friends, come hither. I am so elated in the world that I have lost my way forever. I have a ship laden with gold. Take that divided fly and make your peace with Caesar. No, not no, no. I have fled myself and have instructed cowards to run and show their shoulders. Friend, be gone. I have resolved upon a course which has no need of you. Be gone, my treasures in the harbor. Take it. Leave me, I pray, a little. Oh, I pray you now. But my lord. Nay, do so. For indeed, I have lost command. Therefore, I pray you, I'll see you by and by. The queen, my lord. 
The queen. Oh, whither hast thou led me, Egypt? See how I can bear my shame out of thine eyes by looking back what I have left behind, destroyed in dishonor. Oh, my lord. My lord. Forgive my fearful sails. I little thought you would have followed. Egypt, thou knewest too well my heart was to thy rudder tied by the strings, and thou shouldst tow me after. Or my spirit to full supremacy thou knewest, and that thy beck might from the bidding of the gods command me. Oh, my pardon. Now I must to the young man send humble treaties, dodge the poulter and the shifts of loners, who with half of the bulk of the world played as I please, making and marring fortunes. You did know how much you were my conqueror, and that my sword, made weak by my affection, would obey it on all courts. Pardon. Pardon. Oh, fall not a tear, I say. One of them rates all that is won and lost. Give me a kiss. Even this repays me. <laughs> Love, I am full of lead. Some wine within there, and our viands. Fortune knows we scorn her most when most she offers blows. 